Sometimes the Lord will bring, gather people to a place like this that has a certain history. And so, sometimes it's, it's for an impartation, even from, um, f- from what he did there to the nations. Some, sometimes it's, it's a prophetic picture that he, he uses it for that to say, hey, what I did here, I want to I wanna do that elsewhere. So sometimes it's, it's, a, it's an opening of the well so that something can flow out from that place. Or sometimes it's just a prophetic picture and he's saying, hey, that that impacted people at a local level in such a profound way. I want you to see through that what I'm about to do in a huge way. And sometimes it's both. Sometimes it's more than a prophetic picture. Sometimes there is an importation that something is to flow from there. Because sometimes the Lord releases his tangible presence or glory into a place. Can you all hear me? Okay. Just want to make sure you can still hear me because this is so loud. (laughs) It's kind of interesting, that's all. Sometimes he releases his presence and his glory into a place and it becomes a residual thing. I mean, he leaves it there. And sometimes he does it because that place has become special and the presence just lingers there. And other times he does it because he has plans in the future having to do with that. Like when I, you know, I've been to the Red River Meeting House and Cane Ridge, some of these places of revival. I mean, the first time I ever drove to Cane Ridge, Kentucky, which, which ultimately became the beginning of the Second Great Awakening, which literally saved America. And I remember driving there and I got a few miles away, maybe five, six miles away from, hadn't been there before. A presence came into my truck. I felt the presence of God in a profound way. And I said, what is this, Lord, that I feel right now? And he simply said, I'm still hanging out in these hills. That's all he said. Well, I don't know what, what he wanted to do with that. I, I just went there and I drank from it. Same thing at Red River Meeting House, where Cane Ridge started. What, what went from, what, what, what became a revival at Cane Ridge really started way back at Red River Meeting House. But who knew, I didn't even know back then, that God would start speaking in such a major and broad way once again about Red River Meeting House in Cane Ridge. He wasn't finished with them. I don't know that there are going to be meetings a lot there. I just know that he started giving dreams to people and talking to people about the well that was the wells that were there that he was about to open them again. And this time they would flow from there to the entire nation. And it's not like that would be where the where services took place that impact the nation, but that what God did in the spirit there would be resurrected and married with other things he's done, and this well of revival would be uncapped and flow to the nation as would others. So he puts things in places 
He honors what he did there, but he also uses it later. You know, when Jacob ended up at Bethel, Jacob, Jacob is, in Genesis 28, Jacob is anything but a spiritual man. Even though Jacob is, a, is an important player in God's plan, at this point in his life, in Genesis 28, Jacob is a very uh, unspiritual man. He doesn't, he doesn't even, he read, I don't want to get, break down this too far, but you, if you read the passage, you can see from it that Jacob hasn't even really decided yet whether he's going to serve Yahweh or some of the other gods of Canaan. And yet, he has an encounter with God, has a dream, sees angels ascending and descending, receives a message through that from God, basically says to him the same thing that God said to Abraham. I'm going to do this, 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 and this, and I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless the whole world through you. God doesn't have to have a life in order or a person even moving in any kind of an anointing or in a good, strong relationship with, with him yet. He doesn't even, he doesn't have, none of that has to be in place before God moves on them and says, oh, I'm going to use you and do this and this. Thing. He does that with heathens. Because he knows what he's going to do with them before they, before they do. So he knows what he's going to do with Jacob when Jacob is still a, a conniving thief. And he gives Jacob the promise when Jacob is still a conniving thief. Jacob sleeps that night at this place, and he doesn't know it's Bethel, where God met with his grandfather. And these, because of Abraham's age when he had his kids, and because of how, how old Isaac was, and then how old Jacob was, God's encounter with Abraham at Bethel was probably a hundred years before the encounter in Genesis 28 that Jacob had, a century. This is not something fresh in Jacob's mind. He doesn't even realize it's the same place. He lays down to go to sleep. He grabs a stone. Some translations say he puts it under his head. Some people, translations say he puts it next to his head. Some say he might have propped his head up to sleep on it, although that wouldn't have been real comfortable, would it? But he may have propped a little stone under there, maybe wrapped his a garment around it or something. Or other translations and scholars say he set it next to his head as in maybe it was a weapon for protection. Animal comes in through the night. He's got something. To, we don't know what it was. But he comes to this place. He goes, he sits this next to his head, and then he has this God encounter, and the same word and the same dream in the dream, the same message comes to him that God spoke to Abraham. He gets up the next morning, he says, this house of God, I didn't know it. He's deeply impacted. He takes that stone that was next to his head, and he builds a monument out of it. Now, here's where I'm going with all this. Many Hebrew scholars believe, and I believe, because the ones I've read that believe this make the most sense to me, they believe that the stone Jacob picked up and put next to his head or under his head that night was a part of the altar that Abraham had built a hundred years earlier. Which you can read about in Genesis 12. And that when he went to sleep with that altar, next to his brain that the word of the Lord seeped out of that rock because God had made sure it stayed there and worked its way right into his psyche while he slept because the dream was still in the rock God's dream
he grabs it later when he wakes up and sets it up again as a part of a memorial and altar to the Lord. Could it be that God has brought us to the mourning fields? Because he wants to bring an impartation of that spirit of travail, that spirit of intercession, that spirit of deliverance, transformation, outpouring, baptism in the Holy Spirit. Could it be that we're here because God is saying the anointing is still in the dirt here. And I want you to get it because I need this state to release something for the nation that has to do with this Revival that's coming. Could it be?